there are few individuals who've changed the course of history. Hannibal was one, a military genius. The tactics he developed in war 2,000 years ago almost toppled Rome. Hannibal has the knack of doing the unexpected. He always is several steps ahead of his opponent in terms of thinking and what he does. The Romans dance to his tune because he makes them do exactly what he wants. His battlefield tactics were so successful that they're still copied today. I learned many things from Hannibal that I applied to the campaign planning in Desert Storm. The almost impossible extremes that he went to in order to defeat Rome have become the stuff of legend. People read about Hannibal's crossing of the Alps. They tend just to romanticize it, to fantasize the glory and the adventure. The reality is something very, very different. But behind the bravery and brilliance, there's an ironic twist to Hannibal's story. He brought Rome to the brink of destruction, but in the end, it was Hannibal's civilization that was obliterated. His home city, literally wiped from the face of the earth. So where did it all go wrong? story begins in the Mediterranean, almost 300 years before the birth of Christ. Back then, there were cities that were rich, cities that were super rich, and then there was Hannibal's home city, Carthage. Hannibal's Carthage now lies buried beneath modern-day Tunis, but was once the yardstick for greatness. One city that certainly didn't measure up at the time was Rome. Back in 265 BC, Rome had no Colosseum, no Circus Maximus, and it certainly had no empire. It was merely a provincial backwater. If we wanted to compare Carthage with Rome, well, Rome at this period is absolutely not in the same league. In the fifth century, Rome's a fairly modest place, but if we go to Carthage, it's the glittering metropolis of the Western Mediterranean. But Rome had ambition, and this is what would one day lead to its clash with Hannibal. Within 50 years, Rome had conquered most of central and southern Italy, establishing the first glimmer of an empire. Carthage is the established empire, the Romans are the newcomers, and the Carthaginians just don't really take them seriously. As Rome starts to expand, there's probably some inevitability that there'll be a clash with Carthage. And the first clash was struck over Sicily, when Hannibal was just a child. Sicily has an enormous strategic importance, because it's obviously the bridgehead between Italy and North Africa, so obviously between Rome and Carthage. Carthaginians probably don't actually see the Romans as a threat, though, until well into the first war they fight with them. But suddenly they're coming and they're going for your throat. This marked the first of what became known as the Punic Wars between Carthage and Rome. In total, there were to be three wars, an epic struggle fought over a hundred years, in which the future of the Western world was determined. Carthage controlled her trading empire with a navy of formidable warships. This was a massive advantage they had over Rome, who at the time was not a seafaring force. Up until this point, their battles had been fought on land. If Rome had any serious ambitions to become a power of any significance, she would have to challenge Carthage's supremacy at sea. 
the Carthaginian's navy was the last word in technological refinement. Highly trained crews coupled with a massive fleet of the best, most powerful warships the world had then seen. And all of this developed using a secret method of mass production. The ship parts were pre-manufactured and each part numbered for easy construction. This concept allowed Carthage to quickly build a navy wherever it was needed. It gave them a huge advantage over their rivals. Until, that is, Rome had an incredible stroke of good fortune. One of Carthage's ships ran aground off the coast of Sicily. The Romans pounced on it and took it to pieces. With all the parts numbered, it provided the definitive blueprint on how to build your very own warships. Indeed, within two months, the Romans had assembled a fleet of 120. For Carthage, this was a disaster. Now they were faced by an enemy with ships as impressive as their own. And it wasn't long before the Romans were using them with deadly efficiency. Lying beneath these waters, off the coast of Levanso, Sicily, are intriguing archaeological remains. Scattered over a vast area of the seabed are hundreds of anchors and the cargo from a fleet of ships, evidence of a sea battle that took place between Rome and Carthage. Septusa and his team of marine archaeologists have managed to unravel an astonishing story from these remains. When we started our research in Levanzo, uh, and we came to this place, we found a lot of anchors here, uh, typical Roman anchors. The anchors actually belong to ships from the comparatively newly formed Roman navy. But the anchors aren't from ships that were sunk. The only reason to understand why those anchors were here is that they belong to a navy that was cutting the ropes and leaving the anchors on the bottom of the sea. The Roman navy cut their anchor ropes in order to launch an ambush attack on passing Carthaginian supply ships leaving their anchors behind on the seabed. The success of the attack can still be seen today in the thousands of storage jars scattered in the deeper water. The Carthaginian navy was roundly defeated by the Roman fleet. You, you can't underestimate the impact of the First Punic War because it, it sort of changes everything in the Mediterranean, especially the Western Mediterranean. Within a short period of time, Rome is going to start calling the Mediterranean Sea Mare Nostrum, our sea. By the end of this, the First Punic War, Carthage had not only lost Sicily, but she had also lost control of the seas to Rome. In the next war they'd fight, this loss would commit Hannibal to the epic land journey that would take him across the Alps to surprise his enemies by fighting them on their home ground. From the outset, Carthage's disadvantage forced Hannibal to fight a different kind of war. To beat Rome, he'd force them to fight a war of the mind by doing what they least expected him to do. For a start, Hannibal went on the offensive and attacked an ally of Rome, the Spanish town of Saguntum. 
Hannibal chooses to provoke Rome quite deliberately, and he presumably wants to show the Romans, look, we're Carthage, we're a strong, independent power, you can't push us around. And maybe he would have been quite happy if the Romans had just accepted that and acknowledged that Carthage had a right to exist, had a right to be strong. But part of him may also have hoped that the Romans will rise to the bait. They will fight a war, and then he can give them a real drubbing and show them that, look, you can't despise Carthage, we're stronger than you. Hannibal's siege of Saguntum was a deliberate invitation to Rome to fight him. It worked and set the stage for the Second Punic War. Hannibal knew that attacking Saguntum was a challenge to Rome. He didn't necessarily know how the Romans would respond to that challenge. However, he probably guessed pretty well that the Romans would be very ready for war because the Romans nearly always were ready for war. Hannibal's next move was also one Rome could never have predicted. They fully expected Hannibal to stay and fight in Spain. As far as Rome was concerned, Hannibal had no other choice. He couldn't go by sea because Carthage was no longer the undisputed ruler of the waves. And because Italy was protected from land by the Alps, the walls of Rome, as they were comfortingly referred to by the Romans, they believed that invasion by land wasn't an option either. They don't see how Hannibal could possibly get to Italy. And nobody ever dreams that anyone's going to be crazy enough to march all the way over land from Spain, over the Pyrenees, through Gaul, across the Alps, and try and attack Italy. That just wouldn't have entered their wildest dreams. Once again, Rome underestimated Hannibal. Taking an army of 50,000, a distance of more than 1,000 miles, would be daunting enough to most. With all their camp followers and families, the army itself would be strung out over 15 miles across hostile territory. With major rivers like the Rhone to cross, hostile Gauls to deal with, and even feeding an army of 50,000 for any length of time. This really was no picnic. And that's without his complement of 37 elephants. My elephants, they now, they eat about 150 to 180 kilo per day. And they drink about 150 to 200 liter water per day. If you can imagine with, with 37 elephants, how many food they need on one day. So it's about seven, eight ton a day. I think there was a big problem with Hannibal because on this time you couldn't get no uh, bananas for animals. It wasn't only Rome that didn't expect an army to cross the Alps. The records tell us that many of Hannibal's own commanders expressed doubts about the prudence of such an enterprise. And when looking at what they had to endure, it's hard not to agree with them. People read about Hannibal's crossing of the Alps. They tend just to romanticize it, to fantasize the glory and the adventure. The reality is something very, very different. John Previs has spent 15 years studying Hannibal. And each year, he takes some of his students over the Alps, attempting to follow in Hannibal's footsteps and experience firsthand some of the challenges Hannibal and his men might have faced. While the exact route is still argued over, it's clear that the odds were stacked against him from the start. His first challenge was to stave off attack by hostile local tribes. Snaking through the narrow pass, at times only two or three abreast, his army was incredibly vulnerable. Twice, he was viciously ambushed by the savage tribes of Gauls. With great difficulty, Hannibal was able to beat off both attacks, but not without significant losses. I think that at this point, when Hannibal crossed the Alps, 
It was certainly the point in his career that tested his mettle, if you will. This was the point where we were able to see the character of Hannibal, the leadership ability of Hannibal. We see Hannibal able to rally his men in the face of so much adversity, in the face of attack by the Gauls, in the face of the harshest elements imaginable, in the face of starvation. Hannibal keeps his men together and keeps the column moving up and over the Alps. Hannibal crossed at the onset of winter. More used to the sunny Mediterranean, an army from Spain wasn't equipped to cope with such conditions. Each night he'd lose men to the effects of frostbite and exposure. And with no access to food, as he moved higher into the Alps, his provisions dwindled. We don't know if Hannibal's men ever came to a point where they doubted him. We knew there were desertions, but not many. There were heavy casualties, but they had to put their faith in their leader. And Hannibal, we know, was a good general in many respects. For one thing, he connected with the common soldier. Hannibal chose to sleep on the ground with his men. He ate out of the same pots that his men ate. He would eat no more than his men would eat. So we know that Hannibal led by example, asking no more from his men than he himself was willing to give. As Hannibal's army moved ever higher into the mountains, the risks to his men became more acute. Donc, il faut surtout qu'il qu reste pas passif, qu'il se laisse pas glisser. Parce que si tu te laisses trop glisser, tu prends trop de vitesse, tu ne peux plus t'arrêter et arriver en bas avec les rochers, c'est la mort. And this was something that Hannibal's army was about to discover for themselves. Hannibal was able to rally them. They got to the top of the pass. Hannibal stood there and he said to them as they went over, we've scaled the ramparts of Rome. The worst is over. Only to find that as they started down the other side, it was far worse than they could have imagined because the descent into Italy was far more costly in terms of human life and human suffering than the ascent to the pass had been. Just as Hannibal's army reached the highest pass and quite reasonably expected the worst to be behind them, the weather turned and fresh snow started to fall. This was to be the most treacherous part of all. So now there was the old snow with a cover of new snow on it, making conditions even more treacherous because the old snow underneath had become like ice. It's reckoned that Hannibal lost as many men and animals over the precipices as had been killed fighting the Gallic tribes. Indeed, when you look at the losses Hannibal's army sustained, it really makes things look a little different to the idealized and triumphal crossing of the Alps. By modern day standards, Hannibal's crossing of the Alps was a, an unmitigated disaster. Hannibal suffered 50% casualties, a figure that today, politically and militarily, would be unacceptable in any war short of a nuclear war. Hannibal entered the foothills of the Alps with an army of some 46,000 men. A combination of the two ambushes by the Gallic tribes, the appalling weather, and the treacherous descent, all took their toll on his men. By the time he emerged on the other side in Italy, he'd lost half his army, a staggering 20,000 men. When we look at what Hannibal accomplished, the crossing of the Alps, it makes us realize how close he came, not to victory, but to defeat. For had Hannibal and his men perished of starvation and of exposure on the slopes of these Alps, as they well could have, Hannibal would have disappeared from the pages of history and would have been relegated to nothing more than an insignificant footnote. To lose half his army before even reaching Roman soil could have spelled the end of Hannibal's campaign. But it didn't. What allowed him to continue boils down to one critical factor.
Hannibal commanded what was, in essence, a mercenary army. Hannibal's army is the best in the world at that time. It's very experienced. It consists of professional soldiers. Fighting is what they do. He built his army around a core of trusted crack troops. It was a veritable multinational melting pot of men drawn from Carthage's many subject territories. It's also a well-balanced army. It consists of lots of different nations, all speaking different languages. But each of them bring particular techniques of fighting that together are far more formidable than an army that everyone fights in exactly the same way. The genius of, of Hannibal is that he takes all these disparate elements and gets them to work in combination. Utilizing their different skills, he united them into a formidable fighting force, far deadlier than merely the sum of their parts. The bulk of Hannibal's army was made up of Spanish soldiers who formed the core of his infantry. Famed as warriors using a curved sword, the Falcata. In addition to his troops from Spain, he had various specialists. Slingers from the Balearic Islands. From today's perspective, using a sling as a weapon might seem a bit primitive, but they were formidable. They more than matched any contemporary archer. Legend has it that the Balearic slingers were paid in women rather than gold or silver. And then there were the Numidian cavalry from North Africa. They were incredibly maneuverable. They would charge the enemy, shower them with javelins, then flee, only to rally and repeat the attack. These blokes don't ride with a saddle, they don't ride with a bridle, they don't wear any armor, they're very fast, ride small, agile little ponies, and they're natural horsemen. They've been riding since they were small boys. On the battlefield, there was no cavalry that even came close to matching them. With his fast and flexible army, Hannibal was a formidable opponent by any standard but he had another ace up his sleeve, a weapon designed to strike fear and terror. Almost as famous as Hannibal himself are the elephants he used in battle. These were the Carthaginians' terror weapon. Small numbers of elephants could have a massive effect. It's not hard to imagine why. The sight of charging elephants would strike fear into any right-thinking person facing them. Elephants are mainly terror weapons. They scare the living daylights out of the enemy, make them run away. They're big, they're gray, they make strange noises, they're smelly, they frighten people. There's something that no one's ever seen before, particularly for a Roman. You've never seen an animal that's that sort of size, and you certainly haven't seen one bearing down on you in great numbers. So all it has to do is turn up and come charging towards you, and you're already pretty scared. You cannot imagine how fast an elephant can be if, you, if he goes wild. Uh, the most people, they think an elephant is very slow and because he's so big. He's like 40, 45 kilometers per hour. He can move very, very fast. So I think it's a very effective weapon in the war. The elephants used by the Carthaginians were a smaller, now extinct breed of African elephant from the foothills of North Africa's Atlas Mountains. The deployment of the battle elephant wasn't particularly subtle. Immediately before the battle, the elephants were first plied with wine. I can imagine he, he used some alcohol because elephants, they like alcohol, like beer or wine or something like this. They will, they will drink it. And it's like, the effect is like f for people, some people are very shy. So uh, they drink some alcohol and they're the biggest fighter in the world. And this isn't with an elephant. You can turn uh, the, the character with alcohol. The elephants would then be prodded in their ankles. In their inebriated state, this would have made them as mad as hell. Then it was simply a matter of pointing them at the enemy and charging and hanging on. 
the elephant is very big and very large, and it's just going to trample its way through any formation. So they're very formidable. They can break up particularly dense bodies of troops, and cavalry they're just frightened by terrifying the horses. Hardly a weapon of surgical precision, the idea was that they would batter the enemy, breaking their lines. When an elephant attack people, he will use his whole body. So first of all, they will roll the trunk in. They get down with the head and they attack with the trunk and hit very hard. If they have tusk and use the tusk, you will maybe already be dead by a, by a hit from a tusk. And the feet, they, they go on and, and smash everything under the feet. They go like tomato juice. However, there was a fundamental flaw to this weapon system. They were inherently unpredictable. The problem is that they're temperamental creatures. They really don't naturally do this sort of thing, and they don't want to be in a noisy, colorful, swirling battle. By and large, if you have a five-ton fighting machine, it is better if it isn't temperamental, drunk, and knows who its enemies are. Since running amok is something an elephant can also do very well. He don't know the difference between uh, Roman people and Carthaginians. They only learn to attack people. And it don't matter what, black, white, yellow, green, they go and attack everything. As a last resort, the elephant driver was issued with a spike and hammer to drive into the elephant's skull to kill it. The problem with this is that very often the reason why the elephant's panicked is because its driver's been killed in the first place, and even if he's, he's still alive, he's probably hanging on for dear life just to stay up there and not thinking of anything clever like that. But even with a terror weapon and a flexible fighting force, they're of little use without the skill to deploy them effectively. As a battlefield commander, Hannibal still ranks as one of the world's elite. Hannibal's military legacy is really one based upon tactical genius, tactical skill. It's particularly at the battlefield level that he tends to be most admired. In both of his first battles in Italy, he managed to defeat the Roman army despite being hugely outnumbered, simply by using the element of surprise. Hannibal has the knack of doing the unexpected. He always is several steps ahead of his opponent in terms of thinking and what he does. He can set them up in ambush positions. He chooses where the battle will be fought. The Romans dance to his tune because he makes them do exactly what he wants. At the battles of Trebia in December 218 BC and then the following year at Lake Tresemine, Hannibal ambushed the numerically superior Roman army, well and truly crushing them each time. But Hannibal's ultimate lesson in tactics would come in 216 BC at the Battle of Cannae. Having had their noses bloodied twice already, the Roman army was determined not to make the same mistake a third time. This time they really meant business and dispatched an army of some 80,000 to deal with Hannibal. They hoped for the last time. It was the largest army Rome had ever marshaled, outnumbering Hannibal's forces by something like two to one. The Battle of Cannae is Hannibal's greatest challenge. He can see the Roman army is bigger than his. They've got twice as many heavy infantrymen as he's got. Hannibal's got to find a way of defusing that power somehow and of using the Roman strength and their power against them. And to ensure that there could be no ambush this time, at Cannae, the Romans met Hannibal on an open plain. You have to imagine about 100, 150,000 men stretched out in the field over there. They're stretching from the river for about four kilometers out in that direction. Every single one of them is terrified. Their hearts are beating, butterflies in their stomachs. Some of them feel physically sick. They're wondering who's going to be alive at the end of the day. The Roman army masses in a large formation. Their plan is simply to use their massive numerical advantage to steamroller through Hannibal's army. 
Hannibal stretches his men into a single thin line to face the Roman onslaught. Then, just to show the Romans he's not frightened of them, he actually advances the center of that line to put his men, when they start the battle, nearer to the Romans than they needed to be. Hidden behind this line, on either side, are his best heavy infantry, the Libyans. The most disciplined troops in Hannibal's army are the Libyan infantrymen raised from North Africa. These are very well trained and they're very heavily equipped. And these people can go head to head against Roman legionaries and stand a good chance of winning. Hannibal then sends his cavalry on each flank to fight their opposite numbers on the Roman side. All he emphasizes to his cavalry officers is that they've got to win quickly. Time is the critical thing at the Battle of Cannae. Hannibal's plan relies upon each thing happening in sequence, and if one fails, the whole thing would unravel. The Roman juggernaut then meets the thin line of Hannibal's troops, and after fierce fighting, Hannibal's line begins to give in the center. The Romans are successful at first. They, they push back the Celtic and Spanish infantry, forcing the Crescent to turn inside out. Now, they think they're winning. That's exactly what Hannibal wants them to think. At this stage, the Roman armies send more and more men into the center to keep pressing their advantage. As the fighting line is pushed back, the Romans find themselves with Hannibal's Libyans on either flank. Now Hannibal gets these, his best infantry, to wheel round and attack the Roman army from both sides. The Roman army has been drawn into a trap. Finally, Hannibal's cavalry, having defeated the Romans, regroup and attack from behind. The Roman army has been completely surrounded. Tactically, the Roman army hasn't got a hope. Maybe some 50,000 men are surrounded in one dense mass. They can't fight effectively, they're trapped. But then Hannibal's army has to kill them. And that's when the grim part of Cannae begins. What followed was a massacre. Rome's army was, to all intents and purposes, annihilated. But what makes this particularly terrifying is this isn't mechanized fighting. This is all done hand to hand. Most close combat at Cannae is fought using this kind of weapon, a short sword, which can be used not just for slashing at an enemy, but also for stabbing. You can hunch in against an enemy and stab at them with the sword. Um, you're not restricted by having men close to you. This is a falcata. It's a slashing sword. It's a natural chopping action for the sword. But also, if you hack at an enemy, and even as you draw it away, you're going to cut even deeper as you do so. You're slicing great chunks of flesh away with it. It won't kill people, but it will immobilize them and leave them slowly and painfully bleeding to death on the field. This is the pilum. It's the basic throwing weapon of the Roman infantry. It's got a heavy head which punches through the shield, and then the narrow shaft is carried by the weight behind it. Even if the shield held this far away from the body, it's capable of going through the shield and carrying on to actually kill the man behind. It can actually transfix the shield onto his body. Um, so the shield itself is useless as a defense against it. These people aren't being killed with neat little bullet holes, even relatively neat kind of stab wounds from spears. They're being hacked down by, by thick, broad-bladed swords. People are even having limbs removed. You've got innumerable mutilated corpses lying on the battlefield and all of them just pouring their blood out onto the ground. Even if the average person or horse lost, you know, two pints of blood on that ground, that's 100,000 pints of blood spilt onto the soil of Cannae. Cannae remains one of the bloodiest battles ever fought. It's estimated that Rome lost more than 50,000 men, the largest loss of life in any single day before or since. Even today, military historians and a lot of professional soldiers are still fascinated, almost obsessed by the Battle of Cannae. And it's held up as the example of the most complete tactical victory. They'll talk in terms of perfect double envelopment and all this sort of thing. So complete was this victory that Hannibal's tactics are still taught in military academies more than 2,000 years later. And in the first Gulf War in 1991, 
Hannibal's tactics at Cannae were employed by the UN commander, General Stormer Norman Schwarzkopf. I learned many things from the study of the Battle of Cannae that I applied to Desert Storm. So you can see basically what our problem was at that time. We were outnumbered as a minimum three to two as far as troops were concerned. We were outnumbered as far as tanks were concerned. And we had to come up with some way to make up the difference. We used a little misdirection and we allowed, uh, we allowed the Iraqis to think that we were going to do something that we weren't going to do. And, uh, and they bought it. Like Hannibal, Schwarzkopf had his enemy focus its attention in one place while he enveloped and surrounded them. We really used economy of force, just as Hannibal did. We used economy of force to fix the enemy, uh, fix the strength of the enemy, keep them focused uh, in one area, while we went ahead and used maneuver to get around behind them and on their flanks. At the same time, we launched the 1st Armored Division, the 3rd Armored Division, and because of our deception plan and the way it worked, we didn't even have to worry about a barrier. We just went right around the enemy and were behind him in no time at all. The 7th Corps came in and attacked in this direction. The 24th Infantry Division made an unbelievable move all the way across into the Tigris and Euphrates Valley. The only avenue of egress left because we continued to make sure that the bridges stayed down. So there was no way out. Among military historians, Cannae has become a byword for an overwhelming victory, a tactically perfect battle. Despite it, however, Hannibal's next move was even more surprising. He handed Rome the key to his own downfall. After the Battle of Cannae, Hannibal had accomplished more than anyone could have imagined He'd beaten Rome's armies on the battlefield a total of three times. And these battles weren't just defeats. They were catastrophes of historical proportions, made all the worse for the Romans because they were fought on their home ground. In the two years since Hannibal's arrived in Italy, he's killed something like 100,000 Romans and their allies. He's killed a third of Rome's Senate. Absolutely every family is in mourning for some relation or other, or used to sit next to someone who is now not there anymore. By the standards of the day, Hannibal had clearly won not just the battles, but the war itself. Hannibal has won the war as he understands it, and he clearly expects the Romans to admit defeat, to roll over, say, right, fair enough, you've beaten us, and begin peace negotiations, and accept whatever terms he, the victor, chooses to impose on them. The problem was that the Romans wouldn't accept defeat. The Romans are not giving in. They keep on going. And this is a basic truth throughout all periods of history. You only really win a war when your enemy concedes defeat. By refusing to surrender, Rome had, in essence, thrown away the old rule book. He's just inflicted these appalling defeats on the Romans, the sort of things that would have broken the back of any other kingdom or nation around at the time. They would have rolled over, given in, and said, right, it's a fair cop, Gov, we're beaten. It's over. Hannibal had completely misjudged the mindset of the Romans. This was his critical mistake. The Romans are fighting a life or death struggle. That's how they see things. That's how they think. It's a completely different mindset to Hannibal. It's something he never really understands. As far as the Romans are concerned, there can only be one winner from this struggle. Either Rome herself will cease to exist, or Carthage will. This was a new way to think. This was the Roman way. From Rome's perspective, having Hannibal in their backyard was plain humiliating and needed putting to rights. Rome is beaten down, it's on its knees, but it doesn't give in. This is someone it knows has nearly destroyed the Republic, and the Romans are not going to forgive this and they're not going to forget this. Very cleverly, they decide that the best way to fight Hannibal is not to fight him at all. So for the next 14 years, they leave him to traipse around the Italian countryside, vainly trying to goad the Romans into a fight but they refused to be drawn into another pitched battle. 
The Romans are denying Hannibal his greatest strength. He's got this terrific army. He's the most gifted tactical commander the world has seen, and Hannibal can't use those advantages anymore unless the Romans actually offer their armies up for destruction. By refusing to be drawn into battle, the Romans had found Hannibal's Achilles heel. His mercenary army was fine when fighting and winning battles, but no battles means new mercenaries become less inclined to join his army, and his core army gets weaker by the month. Hannibal's army gradually declines in size and in quality as the war goes on. The Roman armies keep on improving. So the advantage he has over them narrows. From the very start of the war, it gets less and less until it disappears altogether. The biggest blow to Hannibal, however, was the defection of his elite cavalry, the Numidians, just before the battle that would decide the outcome of the war between Rome and Carthage. And commanding the Roman army at that battle was Hannibal's nemesis. He was Scipio Africanus. He and his father had been facing Hannibal ever since he first arrived on Roman soil. Scipio is present the first time Hannibal defeats a small Roman force. He's present at Cannae. He may have been there at some of the other battles as well. He's seen the greatest army Rome has ever put in the field cut to ribbons by Hannibal's smaller force. So Scipio realizes that this opponent is not one that we can beat easily. Having first-hand experience, he was fairly intimate with Hannibal's tactics. Scipio decided that the only way to defeat Hannibal was to mimic those tactics. He took the fight to Africa and threatened Carthage itself, just as Hannibal had done to Rome. Hannibal was recalled from Italy to defend his home city. Sixteen years after Hannibal started the war, he and Scipio faced each other on the plains of Zama. Scipio does exactly what Hannibal has been doing to a long succession of Roman generals. And when Scipio comes up against the, the other Carthaginians, he outwits them and defeats them with almost disdainful ease, in the same sort of way that Hannibal had done things to the Romans in the early years of his campaigns in Italy. So Scipio is very ready for the confrontation with Hannibal. He's learnt from the master, and then it's just a question of whether or not he can actually beat Hannibal himself. But he's got the talent to do it, he's also got the army to do it. At the Battle of Zama, Hannibal's army lined up with a fresh supply of some 80 war elephants in front of his massed infantry and cavalry. Hannibal charged his elephants in an attempt to break the Roman lines. And it's now that he learns about the weakness of his terror weapon firsthand. Scipio has trained his army to deal with elephants in a very effective way. So Scipio at Zama gets his men to open lanes in the ranks of the army so that the elephants simply go for the least line of resistance. They head through the gaps and head off behind the Roman army and there they're killed, disposed of, or just get lost on their own. Worse still, some of his elephants became a liability as they turned and charged Hannibal's own men, causing mass panic. Then using one of Hannibal's own trademark tactics, Scipio's cavalry, having driven off Hannibal's own cavalry, returned to attack Hannibal from the rear. The pupil had eclipsed the master, and with that, the Second Punic War drew to a close. The bitter twist to Hannibal's story is that although he set out to defeat Rome, the threat he posed forced her to become bigger, better, and badder than ever before. Hannibal had created a monster, a Rome bent on destruction, and a Rome who wouldn't easily forgive or forget what Hannibal had almost done. Hannibal escaped from Zama but as long as he lived, Rome couldn't rest. Eventually, rather than die at the hands of the Romans, he committed suicide 19 years later.
the last obstacle to a complete Roman victory had been removed. And in a third and final Punic War, Rome finally attacks the city of Carthage itself. So, what happens is this, and to start with, they lay siege to it and try and starve them out. And then eventually, they storm the city. And they slowly but surely move up the hill, setting fire to all the tall buildings around them. And you'd have thought that might be the end of it, but it's not. Because then what the Romans do is very carefully, basically destroy the citadel itself. And eventually what you're going to get is they actually cut the whole top of the hill away, to slice it away. And the idea of that is to remove any trace of Carthage. You know, to actually consign Carthage to oblivion. And what that's about is it teaches everybody else what the worst case scenario is. That that could be you. And once you've done it, then nobody ever forgets. Rome at last is really ready to become the sort of Mediterranean superpower. Hannibal's fight with Rome lasted a total of 17 years. While attempting to gain recognition and glory for Carthage, he inadvertently created a new kind of power. The struggle between Rome and Carthage was inevitable in some shape or form. The Roman mindset doesn't really allow for peaceful coexistence with other nations. In their worldview, there could only be a single dominant power, Rome. And Hannibal's role was pivotal. Hannibal's often portrayed as Rome's worst nightmare. Actually, he's Carthage's worst nightmare because he sows, sows the seeds of its destruction. Hannibal makes things happen in a different way. He also probably speeds up the process, completely unintentionally. He frightens the Romans so much that he makes them very ruthless, particularly in relation to Carthage, but also other nations. They start expanding very quickly after they've beaten Hannibal. Hannibal was the powerful catalyst that propelled Rome from being a regional power with ambitions of greatness into the first imperialist superpower that shaped the world we live in today.